You're listening to To another episode of Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here in the middle of September 2019 to bring your mid month book news review. Happy uh, mid autumn festival. Yeah, happy. Um, happy Chuseok. 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 <laughs> happy Chuseok for the Koreans and happy. Mid autumn yeah. for. Us everybody Chinese else, everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> um, do all asians celebrate the uh, I don't, autumn festival no I, I feel like i feel like everyone has a sort of harvest festival because harvest festival. that's what it is but i don't know if everyone celebrates this particular yeah, like, i don't think it's like at the same time yeah is it? yeah well i think i don't know i know the chinese do and i know the Koreans do, but I think we celebrate differently, right? Because you guys don't do the mooncakes. No, no, we don't do mooncakes. Right? This is what us um, children of Chinese immigrants would call mooncake day. Because <laughs> it's the day where we have mooncakes. Yeah, for us, it's like it's like a three-day holiday. Okay. And uh, I mean, a lot of the traditions are kind of like... Like no one follows them anymore, <laughs> um, but there's you know rice cakes and you you're supposed to go to your hometown and like on the second or third day you're supposed to go to your family grave and like clean up okay. and and stuff like that. So yeah, I think for us it's a one day festival. Although uh, Lunar New Year, our spring festival is a like whole week. So oh, so it's like Golden Week in kind in of Japan, kind yeah. Of. <laughs> Um, but uh, you just came back from TIFF. You came back from Toronto. Yeah, I was in Toronto for a week for the Toronto International Film Festival. Saw a bunch of movies. I'm really, really tired. Um, I just flew back last night, and I'm flying out again tonight. Um, if you haven't picked up on it, we're recording this on Friday, the 13th, 2019 of September, uh, which is Midon Festival slash Chuseok. You're probably listening to this. Um, Sometime next week, probably. Probably. Um, once I land in Taiwan and uh, edit. But yeah, I'm flying out to Taiwan tonight um, for some family business. And I am... I'm really tired. <laughs> I'm so it's tired. A long, it's a long flight. Are you, are you the type who uh, who can fall asleep in planes? Um, usually, yeah. Um, the last two times I flew to the East Coast, I wasn't able to sleep. But on the way back from TIFF, I did fall asleep for a little bit. So I'm 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 hoping um, that I'll be tired enough that it'll happen. Like my typical um, Trans Pacific airplane ritual, I guess, is um, we take off. I watch a movie. We eat whatever meal is first. I think it's dinner. I start watching a second movie and fall asleep in the middle of it, and then wake up in time to land. That's lucky i mean i t- i tend to fall asleep pretty easily on planes uh maybe it's because i've I, like you know i flew from a very young age and yeah. I'm, like more comfortable with it but uh as an adult um you know how like the cabins get really dr- the air gets really dry yeah yeah so i bring i bring my korean sheet masks and i <laughs> <laughs> like put it on and i like put my hoodie on and i just kind of like Avoid looking Just at it. Ignore, anybody. ignore the world. I gotta take away. care of your skin. <laughs> uh, yeah. Are there any movies from TIFF that uh, Asian America should know about? Um. Well, we're gonna be talking about this on this week's episode of the Collabcast as well. But, oh well, there um, you go. Good plug. <laughs> um, I saw Hustlers, which is out today. Okay. Um, which is it's pretty good. Um, J Lo's really good in it. Um, I also saw Jojo Rabbit, okay. which was pretty good. I'm curious to see what people what people will think about it because I think it's really well done. I think it's um, it's one of those stories where um, and are you familiar with the the premise of Jojo Rabbit? No, I'm not actually. It's a Taika Waititi film. Okay, already already in. Yeah. Okay. It's about a young boy who is part of the Hitler Youth, um, and Taika Waititi plays his imaginary friend who was Adolf Hitler. Oh, I think I think I've seen a trailer of this. Yeah, yeah. and then um, he finds out that his mother, Scar Johansson, is um, housing a, a Jewish girl in their house. It's it's like a commentary on not only like fascism and authoritarianism, but also indoctrination and like hero worship. 
Okay. And it's really well done. The subject matter is really uncomfortable. And a lot of times when it was, it's really funny as Taika Waititi movies are, but you know, you find yourself kind of being self-conscious about what to laugh at sometimes because of who's being portrayed. Yeah. But it also goes to show like, we should be talking about how like ridiculous some of these like things were that people believed because if we don't talk about it, we never will. Right. And then yeah. things will repeat. So it's, I think it's a great movie. I wonder like, in this like super sensitive time, how people will react. Cause there's already been reactions online, like kind of like dismissing it because of the premise. Mm. And it, it'll be interesting to see, see how it goes, but it, I really liked it. It's really funny and it's really well done and super like just a great, like just makes you think. And that's kind of what you want your movies to do. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Or at um, least for some people. Some people go to the movies to forget about the world. So. Yeah. For those people, there's Hustlers. Um, yes. But also Hustlers is also about the 2008 crash. So <laughs> be prepared for a little bit of a little bit of uh, real world in it too. Um, and then the last thing I watched, I guess the other like Asian American story besides Hustlers is um, uh, Wayne Wong, the director of Made in Manhattan. And uh, Joel Club, he has a new film called Coming Home Again, based on a Chang Lee essay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, that one stars Justin Chan. And that one is like, it's in the movie to the core. Very deliberately paced, but a lot of really strong uh, Yeah, I've, I've heard buzzes yeah. about it early yeah. on. Yeah. Well, we are not here to talk about movies. No, no. We are here to talk about books. I know sometimes we get carried away with other mediums because Marvin and I are cultured people, <laughs> or so I'd like to think. Well, we're going to move on to uh, book deals. And our first book deal is Wednesday Books Acquired North American Rights to Dustin Tao's debut, You've Reached Me as well as the second book. Uh, You've Reached Me is a contemporary story with a dash of magic about a teen girl who, heartbroken after her boyfriend's death, calls him to hear his voicemail. But he picks up. In a miraculous turn of events, they have a second chance at goodbye. Publication is scheduled for 2021. So it's a ghost story? Yeah. Or is it like a time travel thing? Uh, like like I don't the think it's time travel. I don't know. (laughs) It, it's hard to tell from just the premise, but it definitely is very anime to me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty into it. <laughs> um, next up, Farrar, Strauss, and Gru acquired world rights to E.L. Shen's debut middle grade novel, The Comeback. The book follows 12-year-old Maxine, a Chinese-American ice skater, and her struggles to stick the landing both on the ice and in middle school. Publication is scheduled for winter 2021. This seems like your jam. Oh yeah, it definitely, <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is. I know it's middle grade, but I really want to read it. <laughs> I know. The moment I saw ice skating, I was like, "Oh, Rira's gonna read this." There, there are so many uh, brands when it comes to me, and <laughs> <laughs> figure skating is one of them. Um, Simon Pulse bought Sarah Huck's YA debut, Made in Korea. The novel is a romantic comedy about a Korean American teen who sells Korean beauty products out of her locker and manages the school's most successful student enterprise. That is, until the hot new boy gives her a run for her money, leading her to surprising discoveries about first love, family, and herself. Publication is slated for summer 2021. You know, this was a plot point in one of the early episodes of Kim's Convenience. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> but instead of like being a student, it was like the parents. Uh, so like the, the mom was selling Korean beauty products under the table. Oh, okay. And the dad found out and wants in on the action and goes, takes it too far. Oh, man, that's, that sounds <laughs> hilarious. Did, did you have a student enterprise in school? I did not, but I have a friend who did. And it's a really, um, so I went to school back when we all had dial up, right? Okay. Net, the net zero was the way we got, on, got onto the <laughs> internet. But one of my friends was the first person to get a cable connection. So he used this to his advantage and downloaded a ton of porn. Oh, my God. Burned it on the CDs and sold them at school. So, like, he got money for it. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, yeah. that that is definitely <laughs> a hustle. I mean, like, in middle school, I made like pretty envelopes and I sold those for like a dollar. Uh, that's much more wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> That is true. I don't. Wow that that's a really creative way to make money. In school. This was back when like the fastest connection we have is like fifty six k. Man, we've come a long yeah. way. It was pre Facebook, 
pre YouTube, even pre Friendster. Like we didn't get Friendster till like 2002. Yeah. Anyways, next up, Harper Collins Tegan acquired debut author Michelle Sterling's own voices picture book When Lola Comes, illustrated by Aaron Assis. Uh, the picture book is about a Filipino American girl who savors the rich senses of summer with her visiting Lola and finds a way to preserve their close grandmother granddaughter bond after her Lola returns to the Philippines. Publication is set for summer 2021. Oh, that sounds very sweet. And it's a very like immigrant story, right? Because a lot of us don't live in the same continent as our grandparents. Yeah. Well, now it's like so much easier for the younger generation because they have like Skype, Skype yeah. or whatever video call. Like, uh, Koreans use cacao, cacao talk. Uh-huh. And, um, like, before that, we had to use, like, phone cards to call Korea. Yeah, we did too. Yeah. So, like, it's definitely. We're advanced. definitely not dating ourselves on this episode. <laughs> hey, hey. Like, I- I'm younger than you, but I feel like I experienced a lot of the things from your, uh, your time in adolescence because like (laughs) the thing is like a lot of the stuff that i got as a teenager uh was passed down to passed down to me from my older cousins Uh so like i actually used a walkman for a while really yeah i used like a walkman for a year and then i like finally got a cd player because my parents are like no one listens to that anymore (laughs) and i was like well this this is what i got for free so like i'm gonna use it until i get something better you switch to the disc man with the uh, with the ten second memory, so it doesn't skip. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, my my dad went to Korea, and that was when the MP3 players were just coming out. Oh, and I was and, and I got like the Samsung MP3, and my classmates were like, "What the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is what is this like rectangular thing that you're like carrying around your neck?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm from the future." <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I had a real MP3 player. It carried sixteen megabytes. Yeah, those were the days, yeah. right? When you could only fit, like, what, 20 songs? <laughs> at most, at, like, the lowest bit rate possible. Oh, man. Yep. Okay, next up is Chronicle acquired Disney story artist Carrie Lau's debut picture book, The Twelve Cats of Christmas. A playful take on the classic song, Twelve Days of Christmas, the book features 12 cat characters celebrating the holiday season in true feline fashion, cuddling up by a fire, chasing ribbons, climbing the tree, and generally making mischief. Publication is set for fall 2022. That's cute. Love all these um, picture books coming out. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, I I look up, like, adult fiction book deals, and there aren't that many, mm. um, like, Asian American, Asian literature deals uh, compared to, like, kid lit. And that's understandable because you have, like, organizations like We Need Diverse Books. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know... Hopefully, this will inspire more people to write. That'll eventually bleed over to the adults. The, the young readers who are reading uh, kid list stuff now, <laughs> maybe they'll write adult fiction in the future. Yeah. You but, never know. But I also feel like all of the authors that we know that write adult fiction are like busy on their next project. Yeah, that's so true. That's, that's true. That's also, they're coming. We probably already announced them in past episodes, is what probably. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um. Next up, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt won World Rights to We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi, the author of the best-selling The Reader series. Told in 14 perspectives of a tight-knit group of second-generation Japanese-American citizens, Chi's new YA novel offers a multifaceted look into the mass incarceration of Japanese-Americans during World War II. Publication is stated for June 2020. Yeah, it's like nice that um, we're getting more books about Japanese-American um incarceration in america but wow 14 perspectives that that is quite ambitious yeah i mean it's great because you know a group of people is not a monolith yeah yeah, and there's like it'd be great to see what incarceration was like for all sorts of people from like children to elders to even different types of teens different types of adults um, because everyone has a different temperament everyone kind of sees it differently and so i think stories like this you know we're always talking about how we need more stories and the fact that Tracy is going to give us 14 of them yeah. is going to like really move the needle, I think. Yeah. I, I don't think we uh, we mentioned it in previous episodes, but George Takei uh, came out with a graphic memoir called They Called Us Enemy. Mm. And it, it's about his family's experience in Japanese-American incarceration. Yeah. Um, so we are getting more of those stories, which which is nice because like 
uh, the generation before, they were very like hush hush about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we also have the terror on TV now. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> I can't watch that. I am such a chicken when it comes to horror stuff. So um, yeah, you can watch it and then tell me what happened. The ghost story is not bad. The kind of bummer is that this is such an important time and place, and it's kind of. At least personally, I feel like the ghost story is taking most of the priority instead of like the shitty thing that the government did to these people, mm, you know, mm. um, you know, but, you know, <laughs> got to get those viewers. I, I can yeah. understand. And if you can teach more viewers about this thing that actually happened, you know, it might it might open some doors. Um, okay, so next up we have Rick Reardon Presents bought debut author Gracie Kim's middle grade fantasy, The Last Fallen Star. Twelve year old adoptee Riley Nam desperately wants to have healing powers like everyone else in her Korean witch family. With the help of her sister, Riley attempts to summon Omoni, the mother of all goddesses. But instead, her sister is banished to the spirit realm, and Riley is given an ultimatum. If she wants to get her magic and save her sister's life, she must find the god realm's last fallen star. Publication for the book is set for spring, summer 2021. That sounds really interesting. Last fallen star. Hmm. It's kind of like the... um. The, the the intro to uh um what's the anime uh, it full metal of, alchemist uh, f- yeah uh, <laughs> I don't know it kind of reminds me of House Moving Castle because okay. like Calcifer is a fallen star and there is like a deal made oh. but obviously it's very different but mm-hmm. I am into uh witch stories so I I am interested in reading it as well yeah um finally our last book deal Coco has bought picture book author Andrea Wang's debut middle grade novel. The Many Meanings of Meilan, along with a second standalone novel. When Meilan's extended family has a falling out, she and her parents and grandfather relocate from Boston's Chinatown to a small town in rural Ohio, where she taps into her inner strength and sense of justice to make her own new place in the world. Publication is planned for summer 2021. And that wraps up our book deals. And I think we have one piece of... Uh, book news and Marvin is more knowledgeable about this than I am so I'm gonna like make him take the lead on this well this happened last month like right after our last book news podcast yeah Um, so we didn't weren't able to catch it but the uh, Worldcon 2019 was held in Dublin um, last month and uh, we have a couple of Hugo Award winners um, for best novelette if at first you don't succeed try try again by Zen Show author of the books and Boba pick Sorcerer to the Crown uh, best graphic story goes to Monstrous, Volume 3, Haven, written by Marjorie Liu and art by Sana Takeda. I think this is the third year in a row that Monstrous has won for you know this what? award. They're, they're strong. <laughs> I mean, what are you, you going to do? Are you caught up on Monstrous? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm, I'm up to the end of Volume 3, and man, it's still good. Um, you, should, you should check it out. There are just so many things to read. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the John Campbell Award for Best New Writer went to Jeanette Ng, um, the author of Under the Pendulum Sun. Um, this was her second year of eligibility. And I guess the story here is when Jeanette went up to accept her award, she made a speech that was maybe considered a little controversial, um, basically openly calling out John Campbell, the namesake of the award, um, as a fascist. Um, so... A little background on John W. Campbell, um, the man this award is named after. Um, John Campbell was the editor of Astounding Science Fiction, a one of the original science fiction like magazines, like shorts that collect the short stories. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the magazine that launched the careers of like As- Asimov, of Arthur C. Clarke, um, Robert E. Heinlein, and um, and L. Ron Hubbard mm-hmm. of uh, Sci- Scientology fame, and it was. Um, I'm actually listening to a podcast right now called Moonrise by the Washington Post, going through the history of space travel and the mission to the moon. Mm-hmm. And a big part of the first like section of that podcast was talking about how science fiction um, ignited the imaginations of scientists. Yeah. And like was directly responsible for um, us being able to get to the moon, right? Because before science fiction these stories are all about like we're like adventure pulp right like your indiana joneses yeah. and detectives and things like that so he's very influential like it kind of um it makes sense that they would name the award for best new writer after him uh, but he was also a um raging racist i am really not surprised <laughs> <laughs> um he's written opinion pieces you know supporting segregation um, and like he approved stories that like painted 
like one of the stories that was in Astounding was about like the invasion of the Asian people and how uh. the government created、uh, special weapons that targeted only Asian features. So flat faces and snatty eyes. <laughs> and towards the end of his like his tenure, he like went more and more away from the like harder science fiction of like rockets and、mm-hmm. space. Like there was a story in the podcast saying how his editors and he were questioned by the FBI because they had written a story about atomic weapons at a time when the, the Manhattan Project was still classified. So they essentially predicted nuclear weapons, right? Um, but he started going away from all that and was more towards like the more pseudoscience stuff, like the Elron Hubbard、oh, type okay, of things,、yeah. you know. So one of the things that、um, Jeanette said,、um, in addition to calling him a effing fascist, is that you know John Campbell himself would never have given her this award, and in the world that John Campbell imagined for the future, she would be dead. Yeah, and people like her would she would be dead, and so this um I guess this has been a long time coming because like the fact that John Campbell was a jerk is not a secret in like the science fiction yeah yeah definitely、um, yeah I, I have heard、uh, like after I heard about、uh, Jeanette Ng um um speaking out about、mm-hmm. this issue I've I've heard that there have been other authors who have complained、yeah. about the、uh, the award name like what did they change it to they changed it to the Astounding Award. Uh, which still plays homage to the magazine that launched the medium, right? Because that's what the,、yeah. that's the spirit of the award, but not honoring the man. That kind of reputation is questionable. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, so yeah, that's the story. <laughs> um. I mean, first of all, congrats to Jeanette. Um. She is, I think, the third ethnic Chinese author to win the award in this forty-seven year history. I guess she's based in Hong Kong. Yeah. That. Right. Yeah. I- I think so. Yeah, because、um, I I do follow her on Twitter. <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, I think it's really great that she spoke up, right?、And、she took this opportunity to speak up because, as I understand it, like, I mean, as we both understand it, like, science fiction fandom is still very much white male, cis, yeah, <laughs> straight, <laughs> and you know, it's it's hard for minorities to break in, especially. Um, women, right?、Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> and I guess that was one of the things that she、um, she criticized him about was this was a quote:、uh, "Camel was responsible for setting a tone for science fiction that haunts the genre to this day. Stale, sterile, male, white, which you can see in a, in a lot of stories. Like you can just go down your science fiction section of any bookstore, and it's better than before. It granted, is, it, it is better than before, but, but still overwhelmingly." The same, yeah, right.、Um, and I think that's why I always get excited when I see genre fiction pop up on our book news because those are more things to add to the canon. That's either people of color authors giving their own take on conventional genres like Source of the Crown, or creating their own worlds like Jade War, like Poppy War, and then some of the other、uh, sci-fi fiction that we've read for this book club, like Empress of the Skies. Yeah, yeah. We have come a long way. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about、um, additional thoughts? Yeah, I think it was very brave of、uh, Jeanette to criticize <laughs> the award that she was being given. It is definitely not easy to do, and、uh, I really、uh, commemorate her for taking the opportunity to speak out because、um, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to be like, oh, you're part of the cool club now, and it's just like, <laughs> fuck this cool club. <laughs> yeah.、Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's it's always hard to speak to power. It's always hard because you run the risk of looking ungrateful.、Mm-hmm. But I think that's the thing with being critical. Like, it's not that you want to tear it down; you want to move it forward, right? When when we complain about things in like representation or in like kind of having. Three dimensional characters. We're not saying this thing is bad. We, we're saying we, we wish it was better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because、um, I mean, obviously, she Jeanette is someone who loves like fantasy, science fiction. Like she wouldn't write such great stories if she didn't. And so we're all trying to build the world we want to live in, and sometimes that means we have to shine a light and like force open people's eyes to the truth、mm-hmm. of things. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I, 
That that is our only piece of book news. I'm <laughs> sure I'm real. I'm like ninety nine percent sure I like missed some big news this week. But the problem is like Twitter has moved on to like so many other pieces. Yeah, of news we're talking that, about SNL these days. Yeah, yeah, so it's like really hard to like. <laughs> <laughs> to find things like buried under all of that. So um, if you have book news that we have missed, please uh, let us know in our Goodreads forums yeah, or we have on a, Twitter. Yeah, we have a news desk forum for you to let us know what's going on. And we will um, mention those things on the podcast if we see it. So um, if you want to help us out, that'd be great. Um, other than that, uh, we're still reading our September book club pick. Rira, can you remind us of what we're reading? Yes. Uh, this month, we are reading Everything Here is Beautiful by Mira T. Lee. And content warning, uh, there are mentions of mental illness and how it impacts family members as well who are being caretakers. So if you are sensitive to that material, uh, proceed with caution. And um, also, uh, September, That that is our birth month for oh, yeah. for this podcast we are officially now three years old we have read 36 books officially officially we've definitely <laughs> read more than that yeah um i guess yay us yay us <laughs> marvin you've come such a long way since this podcast has started you as well, Rira. <laughs> Remember when you weren't sure if you can sustain yeah, a conversation? Yeah, I, 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 I was just like, I like books, but I don't think I could talk about it for like an hour. <laughs> oh, we could. Yeah. And more if we wanted to. Um, yeah. Um, I guess we're planning some big things for this next year. Now that we um, want to keep this book club going, um, we're probably going to... Um, Try to do more of it. Try to figure out how to do more of it. Yeah, so, um, more exciting things yeah. to come. So um, stay tuned. Um, and as always, if you want to support us, um, please follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our podcast, um, listen to our podcast. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, uh, leave us a rating and review. Um, it does help a little bit, not as much as it does before, but it also lets us feel really good to know that people enjoy what we're what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean... Don't forget, we're just two people in a locked studio. <laughs> so we don't really... And sometimes we forget that there are actual people on the other side. So please just like kind of knock and let us yeah. know that you exist. <laughs> well, we were happy Chuseok. Happy Chuseok. Happy Autumn Festival. And um, for everyone listening, uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Bye, bye everyone. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This episode was hosted by Marvin Yue and Riva Yu and produced and edited by Marvin Yue. This podcast was recorded at the Potluck Podcast Studios located within the Visual Communications offices in downtown Los Angeles. You can learn more about Visual Communications and their programs such as the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival by going to their website at vcmedia.org. Thanks also to the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American host podcasts that Books and Boba is a proud member of. You can learn more about our fellow Potluck Podcast by checking out the website podcastpotluck.com. Hi, this is Taz. And this is Zara. And we are the Good Muslim, Bad Muslim Podcast. It is a show about being two Muslim women in America. We talk about pop culture, the pork lobby, periods. And we talk about Islamophobia, patriarchy, and smashing white supremacy. It's a range. Download the Good Muslim, Bad Muslim podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Or at goodmuslimbadmuslim.com.